have erupted throughout the This Commonwealth has been dealing with the pandemic that is laid bare. There's been a 150% increase in cities over the killings of black Americans and put on full display. Uh, a city that's feeling less and less safe every our day. society's inequalities. Mending justice and justice. Tonight demands for justice. This display hasn't been in words or theories. Again, an exchange of gunfire. It's been in death. It could have been me. It could have been you. White police officer knelt on his neck. This Commonwealth has been dealing with the pandemic that is laid bare. There's been a 150% increase in cities over the killings of black Americans. And put on full display. Uh, a city that's feeling less and less safe every our day. Our society's inequalities. Mending justice and justice. Tonight demands for justice. This display hasn't been in words or theories. Again, an exchange of gunfire. It's been in death. It could have been me. It could have been you. White police officer knelt on his neck. Good evening, this is Lamont Collins, The Healing Process, Roots 101 African American Museum. Like I promised you that we would have the mayor of Louisville, Kentucky, Greg Fisher tonight. You know from all our previous show, healing process started from really the, the trauma and the violence that happened in Louisville, Kentucky due to Breonna Taylor's uh, uncertain death. Uh, but we talked, reached out to Mayor Fisher, who Mayor Fisher had really became a person that I could reach out to and discuss things with without any connections to the discussion, but just being honest men and talking behind the scene, and I appreciate him for that. Let me introduce you, Mayor Greg Fisher of Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome to, welcome to the healing process. Well, it's great to be with you, Lamont. I've always enjoyed our conversations and look forward to this one. Well, cool. We'll, we'll get right into it. You know, so many times, uh, Greg or Mayor Fisher, uh, people talk, people don't know the person, right? And I've seen you get interviewed so many times, but I don't know anything about you. So tell, tell us about Greg Fisher. <laughs> I know heavy is a crown. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> well, uh, I'm Greg, okay? I'm okay. born that way. I'm going to die that way. Okay. And I'm just a, a business person that happens to be mayor right now. I'm not a lifelong politician. My family's from Louisville. My mom and dad grew up in the West End of Louisville. Uh, my dad uh, grew close, uh, grew up close to Shawnee Golf Course, and he was one of eight kids. His dad sold uh, nickel policy life insurance door to door, and he, uh, his older brother said, uh, his name was George. They called him Pargy. Said, "You got to get up out of bed, come over here to Shawnee Golf Course, and learn how to caddy, so you can help support the family." Mm -hmm. And so he started doing that from when he was eight years old, and went on to be the best golfer that came out of Kentucky and got a college scholarship, which then went into the Air Force. So the game of golf and public golf courses changed my life. I wouldn't be married today if it wasn't for that. And then my mom 
grew up on the other side of, uh, of Broadway. Her dad was a pharmacist and had Hardesty Pharmacy at 38th and Broadway. So the West End's always been a big part of who I am. And I grew up in a Catholic family and kind of a social justice tradition. And my mom's value was always, if you can help somebody, Greg, help them. Okay. And then my dad's, and I could see it by the way he interacted with everybody. It didn't matter who they were, rich, poor, black, white. Um, he was just kind of a smooth operator because he treated everybody the same and had okay. great respect for that. And those two values really are what formed me. Uh, we lived in Louisville till I was about eight and then moved to Chicago and New York. My dad was a sales manager for IBM. And then we moved back here uh, when he came back to run a company here in town. I went to Trinity High School. Uh, so, again, more of that kind of Catholic social justice uh, tradition that really, as I look back, kind of formed my outlook on uh, how to integrate with people, uh, how we see everybody should be the same, mm -hmm. but not everybody is the same. Correct. And that's a strong part of the education that I received growing up. Well, well you said the West End of Louisville, and the West End of Louisville was different then. I mean, I'm born and raised in Louisville, too. I remember when the West End of Louisville – was a predominantly white community that had two major golf courses, one major golf courses, no, two major golf courses, right? Right beside each other? No, two major well, parks yeah, and one Charlie, major go yeah. golf course, which one of the few cities that even had that kind of setup at the time. And I remember they had the Dew Ranch the, where you could go ride the horses, mm -hmm. and, 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 and West Louisville was and still is a beautiful place. But at the time that we navigated as teenagers, it definitely was different than what it is now. There's no question about that. And, you know, the flood uh, impacted our city in a significant way because the flood took place. Automobiles started becoming more omnipresent. Suburbs became a thing. So white flight out of the West End uh, really changed mm -hmm. the West in a significant way. Especially after the riots. Well, then that was a significant event in, in 68 as well. Mm -hmm. And I can remember as a kid when we moved back here, I was, uh, I guess, around 12 years old, 10, 12 years old or so, and I'd go would go down to the location where the pharmacy was located at 38th and Broadway and help my grandfather to cut the grass and things like that, and asking him, because it was different. We lived uh, in the east off of uh, Lime Kiln Lane, and so for a young mind, it was like, you know, Papa, we call him, you know, Papa, you know, why, what's going on here? And you could still see some of the destruction from 68 and the way the community had changed. And so him talking through what had happened, how it happened, and to see how he treated uh, the community, especially the black community, then it, there was no, I'm white, you're black, you know, we're just all in this together. And I've met a bunch of people since I've become mayor that knew Old Man Hardesty, mm -hmm. they called him, and told me stories about who he was and what his heart and soul was like beyond what I knew about him as right, a loving right. grandfather, which and, I really – you know, at the museum, we always say legacies matter. Yeah. And his legacy matters in your life and make, made a difference in the West End of Louisville. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned you went to Trinity High School, right? And I told you I went to Fern Creek High School. And, and my – and we'll start getting into what everybody wants to hear about, whatever. But I remember when I was – and uh, I grew up uh, in the best – when I – in elementary age, I grew up in Bastion Manor area, right right uh, near uh, Elba, Huron, and all that, across from Bastion Manor Elementary School. We were the first black family that moved in that area. And what I remember about Trinity, I may have told you this story, uh, it was like 72, 73, we would walk to the bus stop to take a bus downtown to my grandmother's house. And, uh, you know, 72, you know, things are still going on then as they go on now. And we had Trinity kids would come by in a car, and they would call you a certain name, and the ki and Trinity kids would get out of the car for the confrontation. St. X kids would go down Borstown Road. They would blow the horns and keep on going, right? And so I grew up very early age saying Trinity kids were willing to fight, what, no matter what the situation. That's how I grew up with this mindset about Trinity kids, right? And then um, – then one of my best friends growing up, Steve Crump. I think you know yeah, Steve sure. Crump. Steve was one of the first black students at Trinity, right. if I remember uh, him, Don Jones. And I remember when my grandmother had a beauty salon on Preston Street in Smoketown, how those guys would walk through the neighborhood of Smoketown. 
get a ra rash because they were going to Trinity High School mm -hmm. at the time, right? But the foundation of the Catholic Church, and you said you were Catholic, they sent so many young black kids to school. A great education. I remember Flaget, Trinity, St. X, if I remember. And Flaget was like a powerhouse during that yeah. time before before it went under. But anyway, but I remember Steve. Well, and my dad was a Flaget. Oh, it's Flaget? Okay. Grad, yeah. Okay. yeah. And you're Fern Creek. Yeah. So I was born in Fern Creek. And okay. that's where we lived originally before we moved out of town uh, and came back. Well, cool. And I, Brett, when did you uh, finish? 77. I, okay, I'm 76. Yeah, so. right. I'm in so the So we crossed paths. We crossed paths. We probably <laughs> knew each other. Bro. You probably knew my brother more than me because uh, he, him and Steve Crump hung out yeah. a lot together. But I remember when Steve then would walk through Smoketown, they would get a rash about going to Trinity, right? And but they were going for a better education at the time. Yeah. But I remember how, and Steve was like the last guy to fight. You know, he wasn't a fighter. And I remember when, when I would get off the bus and see him walking on the bus, and Steve, how do you survive at Trinity? I remember these guys coming by every day, calling me the N-word and getting out of, so what happened? And, and Steve says, he says, well, I just go to school. He says, I go to school. He says, when I'm in school, I hear none of that, you know? And so when he told me that, it changed my whole perspective of Trinity kids. You know how you let yeah. one bad apple. Yeah, no, like when you said that to me, I'm like, oh my God, I yeah. didn't. Yeah, but Steve Crump and Don Jones are legendary yeah. guys. Yeah. You know, and uh, Don, of course, has passed, but Steve's still doing what his great work is. You know, released the latest film about Ali and, exactly. and all that. And you know, it's like when you go back with people and have common experiences, whether it's high school or whatever it is, you feel a bond too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, so that's my bond now. Let's get into the meat of what everybody's probably looking for is Mr. Greg Fisher, Mary Greg Fisher's answers to, to Louisville as a leader. And, uh, and as I, I can't imagine looking through your eyes right now because I know how difficult it is to look through my eyes now, and I'm not the mayor of the city, right? But all the things that we're dealing with, you know, I bring the change. Wherever I go, I bring the change. And I bring the change because it's so easy to start with the history. And I think you agree on that. So when we bring the change more than 400 years old from Ghana, we can walk through systematic racism, injustices, all those in these chains. So what I like to do is just kind of ask questions about that as if we were going to the length of this chain, right? And the first one is since we're dealing with police, we cannot say we're not dealing with police issues in Louisville, Kentucky, or you're not dealing with them as mayor, right? And we know the history of uh, the police force, white people owned policemen, black people ran from policemen. Historically, we had the slave, cha uh, slave patrol, slave codes, and police force was created to bring black people back as property. Now, we're dealing with the police force today. Do you believe, or can you say, that you still think there may, there may be still some systematic racism in the police force? or there's need for police reform, or what's your thoughts about police today? Well, the need, uh, policing is at a crossroads in America right now, and it is in Louisville as well, because in order for uh, policing to be legitimate, the community has to say it's legitimate. When you take a look at the chains, and I appreciate when you bring them around, because they're not much different than what they were 400 years ago exactly. in terms of the strength of the chain. And when you think about the roots of policing and slave chasers, slave patrols, and when that's your foundation, and granted we're now some you know 200 plus years later, uh, but it's not like that's been eliminated. So uh, there are certainly elements in any police department that we would do not want as a community. It's imperative that every police department is proactive in terms of identifying and rooting out any type of racist or discriminatory uh, practices in a police department and people that believe that. Because the way that policing is changing right now, and we call it reimagining public safety, is that policing needs to be equitable, uh, applied equally in every part of town, constitutionally, uh, with compassion, uh, with an eye toward a better outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what reimagining public safety is. We just put a budget out two weeks ago quadrupled the amount of resources outside of law enforcement to introduce this concept or emphasize this concept that public safety starts with community intervention prevention yes law enforcement is part of that but then the community mobilizing 
in a way, in a whole-of-city ap approach, and then reentry as well so we can make sure that folks get back to work and get mainstreamed back into the community. It's not just the police that creates public safety, but the community and the police co-producing, working together to create a safe environment based on respect and trust has got to be there. Mm -hmm. Is Louisville there? Is America there? No. Mm -hmm. Is there a desire and practices in place to get there? Absolutely. Now, this uh, schism, if you will, between police and uh, many of the citizens of America and Louisville was on full display in the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. What we have seen over these past years uh, are you know, too many killings, oftentimes of uh, black people in our country with officer-involved shootings. Uh, there's videos everywhere. And it, it, each one, I can't feel it like you can feel it, Lamont, but I understand the you know, re-traumatization that takes place. Uh, some happen under cert certain circumstances that are somewhat understandable. Others are not. And it just keeps raising these questions of how does this happen? Uh, how do we reform policing so that these issues don't happen where there's injustice or circumstances that just can't be explained? Well, how, how hard is it to navigate that as a leader that knows right from wrong and you view things video-wise of that, uh, just, just like with Breonna Taylor, we, we know that went bad, right? And there's so much investigation to it now, but as a leader, a man with compassion, when you see that, how difficult it is to make a decision then when you know how you have a police union and all these regulations against it, does it hinder you from doing the right thing at that time? It depends on what the evidence is and, and what you can see, Okay. right? And so this is the importance of why, you know, body cameras are... If they're turned on. Well, are they on the officer and are they turned on, Right. right? And so, you know, we took a big step here to become one of the first large police departments to put body cameras on everybody. Well, I didn't realize, let's say, for instance, they're not on undercover agents, not required when you're in a search warrant. You know, that's all been changed through Brianna's law, but they're not any good if they're not on because when they're on, at least then you can understand what took place. Exactly. So I think what's incumbent upon any person is that when you learn about things that can be improved, you have to lean into that and improve it. And why wouldn't you do it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what? My job is to represent all of the people of Louisville. It is not to defend uh, the Parks Department or the Police Department. And now if they're doing good things and I'm going to defend them, fine. But it's not like them against the citizens, mm -hmm. right? Because the citizens are the ones who put me in office. Correct. You know, so I've got to understand their perspective and their needs and wants as well. And my job is to try to balance all this as best we can uh, while creating opportunity, while keeping equity in mind. And you keep equity in mind because, frankly, that's a product of history. Correct. And it's a product of history that's had way too much institutionalized racism in it. And for anybody to discount the importance, let's say, of the history of our country, uh, starting in 1619 when the first enslaved people came into our country, and act like that's still not a factor, in today's world, they are disconnected from reality. I agree. I think you, I think you heard me say many times, my role at Roots 101 is to re-educate white America to the true facts of history and educate black America that does not know their history. Yeah, and I wouldn't even say re-educate because mm -hmm. most whites don't know the history. Mm -hmm. Well, the I mean, hist they've been educated on the wrong story of history. And yeah, that's what I mean by yeah the, the lack of it. Okay. Why don't we have this history is part of our curriculum. And of course, now we're here in May of 2021, where you're seeing elected officials uh, calling this, uh, what's, what's the word that they use? Uh, uh, when they're saying they're not going to agree with putting it. Yeah, like 1619. Yeah, project. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out that mm -hmm. right now. I can't think of it now, yeah. but I know what you're talking but about. But you know, it's like, hold on, fellas. This is history, mm -hmm. okay? I would contend that you and I in our lifetimes, if we were taught about this and all of the succeeding generations, white people in particular would have far different perspectives mm -hmm. on equity and issues associated with racism than what exists right now. So if you put lack of education in place with racial isolation that is present in many 
much part of our country, especially rural parts of America. Mm -hmm. It's a toxic mix when you have a changing demographic mm -hmm. that is becoming more and more non-white, and we will be a majority minority or minority white population in 20 plus years or so. Mm -hmm. And when people are afraid of that for whatever reason, mm -hmm. because they haven't been living around people that are different from them, this is the the tension that America is going through oh, it's right now. It's definitely a tension, and I always contend that at Roots 101, we break down the myth of supremacy. And what do I mean? That supremacy has a foundation in America, no doubt, right? But when I can show you that we were the bulldozer for bulldozer, jackhammers for jackhammers, engineers for engineering degrees, and we helped build this place, then I can sit down with you and you can say, what's the basis of supremacy? If we all have done and contributed to America, we can at least put that to the side, and we can heal together learning more about each other. And that's something I talk about at Roots all the time, is that this is the best time, you know, the book, uh, uh, Best Times and the Worst Times. Th this is where we are in America. I was telling Rebecca earlier that, I mean, Jessica earlier that, you know, COVID-19 has done one thing. It has slowed us down enough to look in the mirror at the reflection that we see, and it's who we want to see. And I've, I've watched you, and I've watched what you do. I know you go home to look at your reflection, knowing you do the best you can do. Is that about right? Yes. There's no. I've never had a problem putting my head on my pillow at night and saying, I cut a corner, I made an unethical decision. People might disagree with the decision I made, but I've always made the best decision, given the totality of facts that I had. Right, and it's always about the facts, and I agree on that. You have to know. You know, you can't read half the book without reading the whole chapter, right? Yeah. And your job is to read the chapter and make a decision after the chapter. You know, we talked about red, we talk about redlining, right? We talk about the growth of the West End, the things that we're doing as a city, as a state, to develop the West End of Louisville. And my question to you, because I have a double, I, I look at that, and I think you might have saw an article that I said something in the paper about, is that black people live all over Louisville. And me, as a business person, I like to see programs in effect that encompasses all black businesses in this community, not just the West End of Louisville. And for instance, at Roots 101, we're not headquartered in the West End of Louisville. So a lot of programs, I fall out of the wayside because my zip code's not that zip code, right? So I go, wait a minute. If my father raised me and my mother raised me that I can live anywhere in this community means that I should have the opportunity in any place in this community. So my question to you, are we doing anything to reallocate funds other than saying it's going to the West End of Louisville? Because if that's the case, we just redline it all over again. So how do we make that work where it works for everybody? Yeah, the only kind of funds that are uh, restricted, let's say, based on a, a census district or federal funds, you know, where they specifically are allocated in an equitable basis is how they would look like that, to have more investment in particular census tracts. Mm -hmm. When you get involved with local money, let's say Metco loans and things like this, or business incubators, they're open to anybody. Now, in this particular budget I mentioned, you know, we're investing a lot more in building black and brown business capacity in the city because, you know, numbers don't lie. Sure. And, and here, here's the situation in, in America. The representation for black-owned businesses is 10% of what it should be. Okay, so for instance, here in Louisville, our population is about 22, 23% black. 2.4% of our businesses are owned by black individuals. So that's in Louisville. That's in cities all over America. Right. Uh, so that's, A, it's not morally right. It's not economically right. So. Those, that type of business capacity building is not restricted geographically at the at the local level. It shouldn't be at the finance level either. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, to build businesses, to make sure that folks have the capacity, the access to capital, to do that, the business planning, all the things that you and I have talked about and that you've been a good model on over the years. And when that happens, guess what? Guess who wins? Everybody. Okay, this notion of, you know, if you win, I lose, is a totally antiquated notion that would make you go out of business if you're a business person. Mm -hmm. And so there's some super strong stats out there that demonstrate that if black Americans were contributing at the same level as white Americans were in terms of business star startup, the additional trillions that that would add to the GDP of our economy 
clearly demonstrates this is good for everybody. Correct. So what are we waiting for here, folks? Mm -hmm. You know, the really interesting thing about a lot of these discussions around inequity points to the fact that the systems that are designed in America, the federal level, state level, on down, produce the outcomes that the systems are designed to produce. Exactly. And what you see in my job is you see talent is equally spread, but opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. And so if these systems continue to produce these inequitable results, as a business person, I know what I would do. You change the system. Mm -hmm. And so this is, I'm optimistic right now under the time of the Biden administration when you hear about the American Rescue Plan, the American Jobs Plan, the American Family Plan. What they are all designed to do is fundam fundamentally redefine our responsibilities to each other as citizens. Mm -hmm and not just maintain the status quo. And we measure that a lot, as you know, in financial terms, which there's a lot more being wealthy than just money. Uh, but that's easy to say if you got a roof over your head and food on the table and shoes on your baby's feet. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm hopeful that the jobs plan, the family plan will go through so that these systems will change all the way down to the city level like we're at. Because we can change the way we go about some of these things, but the big money comes from the federal government, mm -hmm. and that's where we really need to see big change to see more, uh, big advances toward racial equity. It will fuel it. I think demographically it's going to happen no matter what, mm -hmm. but why don't we make it as easy as possible? Well, let me show this, because I, I get to talk to a few local developers all the time, and, and you, you hear whispers, and you hear whispers like West End getting $500 million, whatever the number is and nobody else is getting anything. And this is not true figures, because I can see where uh, Savley has a uh, manufacturing plant going in, or Harrodsburg, or you know, surrounding counties have economic engines of businesses that come to their neighborhoods, right? But nobody puts in a paper about the developer that put his money in, or the state incentives that they got in those counties and areas. But when anything happens in the West End, it's like people feel it's a gift basket and not investment. Do you ever get that feeling that people people think that way about the West End Global? Some, some, pe some people have conspiracy theories about everything I've learned in my business, you know, and oftentimes when you hear things like that, what they do is reinforce existing prejudices that people have. Exactly. And so that's what, it's a megaphone for that. Uh, what's been interesting to me is like a white mayor, you know, where I can say things to white crowds about white supremacy about white privilege. And when I do that the first time, I can see people a little uncomfortable. But when we have another conversation, we talk, start talking about the history behind some of this, you know, I see people's eyes open up because there's so much evidence around them. But if you haven't thought about it before, you can think about it in a very simplistic term. Okay. You know, it's like, well, that, they're that way because of that, they're that way because of that, versus, well, let's, let's peel this back a little bit. So I think this is the process that we're going through as a country right now, that the racial justice marches of the 2020 really helped accelerate. And when, of course, when we saw the demonstrations around the country, these, these were mixed crowds, oh, yeah. white, black, brown, Asian, mm -hmm. you know, just when black people. Right. I, that's why I say that America would never go back to what it used to be, because when you look in the streets and who's in the street, it changed America for a lifetime. You didn't see protests, you know, uh, civil rights wise or uh, for African Americans, protest has always been a mean of progress, but it was, but it was mostly us in the streets. Now it's everyone in the streets. So to me, Louisville can never go back the same five years, three years from now because of the young kids I see in the street today and the young kids I get to work with at Justice Now and the different things they're doing in the school system. But there's something else I wanted to ask you because when people found I was coming to talk to you, the protesters sent me like four or five questions that uh, wanted me to ask you, and, and, and I'm sure you don't mind me asking you because I have been part of the protest from the museum standpoint, telling the history of, of protests and all those things. But it was three things, or, or maybe four, and these came from Rhonda Mathis. I know you know Rhonda Mathis. And one question that she asked was, why do they have to dismantle Brianna Square uh, so often and why? Yeah. Uh, so what, you know, it's a public park, right? So there's a couple of things associated with that. One is uh, history took place in that park in 2020. So we, we have a historical marker that we would like to, to place there that's commemorating what took place in the summer and fall of 2020. 
-hmm. in terms of the racial justice protest, uh, the Breonna Taylor's tragic killing here in our city. So people know something took place there. One of my biggest concerns would be if people said all of that took place and there's no remembrance of it other than what we're talking about. History took place there, so that's important to me that that goes there. The park was created as a memorial for fallen police officers, fallen firefighters. That's a deep part of our history as well. So it's kind of interesting how you see all of this history coming together in the same place. It's a public park, so it needs to be usable. The end of the protest going into the winter and early 2021, it, it devolved, if you will, into more of a homeless camp to where we, the solution was to provide housing for the people that were in the homeless camp. And then we put in place, and we've said, we've go, we got to start enforcing this as a public park. So you can protest all you want. You know, during the day, park closes at 11, I think it opens at 6. Can't leave your stuff, but you can bring it back so that it's open to the general public as well. So we're trying just to have it in place, and of course it's, again, free and open for people to come and do anything they want, like everybody else in the community. Mm -hmm. Now, how did, let me, I go with our next question. The other question was, uh, wow, the other question was dealing with, uh, as, as a mayor, you told them that, or they had a meeting with you about reparations, and where was that, and what, what, what is the conclusion of that meeting they had with you about reparations? Yes, yeah, so reparations, of course, uh, the first move I took, I'm, I'm, I'm the president of the United States Conference of Mayors for one more month, and one of the first actions I took was to bring this issue of reparations before the mayors of America, and I said, we need to take a position on this. Uh, and there's a bill in the House, as you know, H.R. 40, I believe it is, mm -hmm. that calls for the establishment of the commission to study reparations and make a recommendation on how to fund those. Uh, because history shows us that America was built on the back of black America, enslaved America. There were promises made, uh, the famous 40 acres and a mule that were never kept. And you see a big difference between black community, white community, relative to uh, wealth and financial ability, even the ability to own a house, and which goes back to redlining, which you mentioned just a few moments ago. So there is a debt unpaid, in my mind, on that. And so the federal government is, is the body that instituted that. It's the body that really only has the capacity financially to make good on that as well. So we're still pushing for that at the national level and we'll continue to do so. On the local level, when you, I see some cities, you know, like we're, we're paying reparations. And when I read about it or talk to the mayors, it's like, well, you know, we're increasing our affordable housing right. investment or mm -hmm. things like that, stuff that we do already that mm -hmm. we just call it. Haven't tagged it. That we way. call it equitable mm -hmm. investments. You know, you put equity, you invest more where, where places have not been invested in before. But I would think and hope at some point in time there will be national reparations that will be some type of financial reparations that are paid and then people can decide what they want to do with those reparations. So because it's, it's, a, it's still a gaping wound, okay? And you, when you take a look at, let's say, Canada and the indigenous peoples of Canada and how Canada made progress in that area or South Africa and the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in these areas, we still have not gone through that as a country because of, you know, denial of the white majority population, political population, that they d either don't want to deal with it or they want to deny the importance of it. But I think it's an important step for us as a country to, you're never going to make good on the past, but you can at least recognize that terrible, terrible mistakes were made and tragedies were made and people were killed and families were torn apart and you just can't say well that's just part of history and you know we became a nation in 1776 and you know we're beyond that mm -hmm. we had a black president mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that's not, these are many these are different topics here so what, what happens and, and i agree everything you're saying uh but when you put your ear to the city and you got two cities you have well, I don't want to say two cities, but you have, two, let's say developers, and let's say business people, white business owners in this community felt that you allowed the protest to take over their businesses. 
have you reconciled with those people yet or have you discussed it or where is that? Has it gone away or are there still business people that feel that you let them down? Yeah, I mean, we heard some of that at the beginning. And of course, uh, for people, for businesses that were uh, in the downtown area, some were impacted. And if, I don't want to minimize that at all. Uh, you know, fortunately, most of them have insurance. That's what's insurance for. Uh, but the city did not have a, a reparations program, if you will, for that. It's um, that's what private insurance is for. I realize that's unsatisfactory towards some business owners. And the amount of uh, uh, destruction to properties in the downtown area was not huge. Now, if you were, were victimized because of that, you're going to feel differently. Correct. But in the beginning, in particular, you know, the first three nights of the protests were very difficult. And you remember the second night, the mm -hmm. Friday night in particular, was when the uh, you know, guys dressed in all black head to toe. And this happened in almost every city in America Correct. on the same night. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this cannot be a coincidence, you know, with windows being broken and looting taking place throughout the rest of the city. Uh, w we did not experience the depth of what some other cities there, but it's still unexcusable what took place there. But private insurance is what handled that for the most part. But you do have to deal with the idea that white Americans are saying reparations on this hand. I've made investment in the inner city, but there's no reparation on my end. It's just whether my insurance is in place or not. Is that for, for the commercial aspect of what we're talking about here. Now, when we talk about reparations, and historical injustice. Oh, I get that. I'm just kind of a very it different out thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when people throw these things out and equate them, it's like right. Okay, they throw that word we, out with we, it as if it's we the need same. to go back to school. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and learn a little bit about history. Right. And that's what we're all, that's what we're about to try to tell them more about history. Now, as 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 a mayor, as a father, uh, and I've heard I mean I've heard the legacy of your family. What is the what? As you have how many more? How many? A year left? Uh, about uh, 19 months. Oh, almost two years left. I try to get you out early. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be going hard through the finish line, I can tell you that. That's cool. But uh, what is the plan? What You talked about the budget, right? And I think it's so much in your budget to help change the city. You want to kind of talk about the things that's in the budget to help, help increase the city? Yeah. Yeah, you know, when I started some 10 plus years ago, what I wanted to try to see was a renaissance in our city in terms of a more dynamic place, a, a growing place, a place of investment. And we've seen that. And it was all, the energy was really going well, and then the pandemic hit. Now, I'm pleased to report that economic growth is really coming back strong right now and investments, and you're seeing a lot of new things take place. But a big part of what I wanted to see was I wanted to see an equitable investment in the city. Uh, the West End of Louisville in particular had not been invested in in decades. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've, we've seen, it's good news and bad news, mm -hmm. Lamont. You know, we've seen more investment in the West End of Louisville since the Great Flood. All right, well, when you th think about that, that's pretty pitiful. I mean, that's almost 90 years ago. Mm -hmm. So good news, bad news. And what I've said, it's just a down payment. So when you look at the billion-dollar-plus investment, that hadn't taken place. And one of the things that just always sticks with me is people would say when I was making these announcements, people would say, Mayor, we trust you, but we've seen people look like you come through here for years and say this, and we've never seen anything. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's been interesting the past couple of years as people see the construction taking place, buildings are finished. So now the conversation went to gentrification. The conversation's kind of shifted, right? Well, it's uh, – well, not to a certain degree, okay, what more are we going to do? And what we've seen with that investment now is starting to draw other investment. Mm -hmm. You know, so then the conversation shifts to, okay, gentrification. We're worried about gentrification. So, you know, uh, that's a high-class problem to have. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're saying, well, let's prove to the country how you can regenerate neighborhoods without displacing the people that have created the soul of the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And then we have this new West End opportunity partnership that was passed by a state government that creates the West End of Louisville as its own tax increment mm -hmm. financing district mm -hmm. that has safeguards in it against gentrification. So we're kind of plowing. There's a tax base incentive, right? That's yeah, the so the, as, you, as you grow the tax base, 80% of that goes back, back right. to the board that will be making decisions on how to invest those in West Louisville. The board is run by basically the citizens of West Louisville, the non-neighborhoods. They'll be making the decisions. It's a black-led board. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we've got some experiments going on in our city that the rest of the country is really going to be watching to see, this is interesting, how do you regenerate without displacement? 
So we're at a different stage of conversation there now. And so now it's like, okay, how do we build capacity within the community to build wealth? Correct. Okay, so one thing's like in this budget I just talked about is I'm tripling the amount of money that goes into a down payment uh, homeowner assistance program. So there's many people that can pay the rent every month, but they don't have, let's say, the fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars is down payment. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say this is a black family. Why don't you have it? Mm -hmm. I was like, my grandfather could never own a home. That's why. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you have it, Mr. White guy? Mm -hmm. You know, because you've been able to pass down generational wealth. Okay, so that's an example of equitable investments. Maybe some people call it reparations. Mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it says, okay, you're qualified. Boom, you get that grant. You just pay. Uh, your mortgage now it used to be rent payment, but guess what? In 20 years, 30 years, whatever the life of the mortgage is, you're going to have a $150,000 asset to pass down to your generation so you can start building wealth. So we have the different phase now of uh, development uh, and investment taking place that I'm very hopeful about. You know, it's been a very intense past year with the pandemic uh, tragedy with Brianna in our city racial justice protests throughout America, anarchy, you know, January 6th in the Capitol. I mean, wild stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm more optimistic about the future of our city now than ever before because you go through these experiences, it makes everybody stronger. And I hope it opens everybody's consciousness to see how we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. We've got to give each other a little grace from time to time, you know, as we work through and try to understand these things together. But you've got to keep moving forward. Now, the additional thing is you got to have resources. Correct. So what the federal government is playing a significantly different role when the Biden administration than the Trump administration. Okay, under the Trump administrations, they saw cities as the enemy, you know, and we're home of anarchy, and they were always coming at us. I mean, oh, I was yeah. spending two, three hours a day of defense, you know, against the federal government. Then people of America decide in an election that has been certified a thousand times over, Not you know, over, yeah that Joe Biden's our president and comes in with a different approach. So as part of that right now, just uh, within the time that he's been in office, we will have in the neighborhood of $500 million over these next several years to invest in our community that we did not have before. So some of the dreams that we had for tomorrow, we can make realities today. And those investments will be guided by an umbrella of equity and some what we call build back better together. So investments in businesses, the arts, uh, homelessness, business capacity, technology. So there's high speed internet throughout our community. So I'm really excited. So I'm mayor for another 19, 20 months. I'm going to have healthy budgets, which that makes me very happy. Well, it makes me happy too. <laughs> but uh, in closing, because I always close with, with one statement, I ask everybody this statement, uh, you know, for having the museum, well, first, before I do that, I need to tag the museum because I'm a nonprofit. I got to ask for dollars. This is Lamar Collins, Roots 101. Uh, you can all help our cause with uh, Cash App at Roots 101 AAM, Roots 101 AAM. Just go to our Cash App application or um, and uh, please support what we're doing. Now, back, I hate asking for money, so it kind of threw no, me off. No, you got to be good at it. And look, one thing a guy told me was, you never know, Lamont, somebody might be dying to give you money. Well, but you just haven't asked right. them before, so they thought maybe you don't need it. Well, no, we need it. <laughs> now, th in closing, I always ask this question, and really you, you've kind of summed it up in the whole conversation. And what I ask, you know, I always say becoming better ancestors. That's one of the models at the museum. And the other one is uh, 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 legacies matter. And what I like to add, you know, let me start it off. What I normally say is that, uh, legacies matter and what I say is as a if I asked you uh, legacies matter what would you say I would hope that everybody lives their lives every day thinking about that they may not think about legacy in terms of I'm a famous person or anything like that but the question is what are you doing each and every day to make your world a better place well, great and if I said becoming a better ancestor that's the other one used what would you say to that well to me it's kind of the same question isn't it it's uh when your children grandchildren great-grandchildren look back upon you and say did that person in my family lineage uh, 
uh, impact my ability to make the world a better place. Exactly. Uh, then you say, okay, then it's my job to carry on, to uh, pass the torch to the people that look at me as an ancestor. Mm -hmm. And what I'll say is that there's an African proverb that said, the greatest king plant shade trees knowing he never set up under them. So the shade tree, the wealth, the shade tree, the knowledge, the shade tree, the education, tra shade, shade trees of, of love and happiness. My role at Roots 101 is to plant those shade trees for young people can sit up under it years after I'm gone. And from listening to you today, I know you've been planting shade trees. And I appreciate you having us uh, coming on. You're, you're coming in here to talk to you about Roots 101 and most of all talking about the community and the job that you're doing in this community. And uh, like I said, I appreciate your friendship and relationship and hope it continues to grow. Well, I'm sure it will. And I appreciate what you're doing. I think we can both go to bed at night with smiles on our faces and say, get a couple hours of sleep and let's get after it the next day. <laughs> All right, have a blessing. All right, take care. Legacies matter. This is Lamar Collins, Roots 101, African American Museum. Legacies matter and so do you. Thank you and good night. Have a blessed one.